Hey, grab your Bibles very quickly. I think you got the gist at least of what we want to begin focusing on this morning. We're going to John chapter 8, a verse actually that you will see maybe on the screens. I don't know. We may have lost everything, uh, but that's all right if we did. Uh, I actually have the verses written down. A lot of scripture this morning that I want to give you. And uh, there we go. And uh, we'll jump right in this morning. For those of you that might be guests today, first time in a long, long time, we've been in an emphasis that we call 10. We're challenging our people to go deeper with Christ and their personal relationships relationships and sharing of the gospel, uh, just across the board, memorizing scripture, just a lot of things that we're doing. And so this fits right in. Last couple of weeks, we've been focused on prayer as a part of 10. What is prayer all about? And uh, we looked at some general things about Jesus and prayer and what Jesus did actually in his prayer two weeks ago there in uh, Gethsemane, uh, the Olive Press, the place of the Olive Press. And then last week we looked at Elijah and uh, that was kind of my passionate uh, close out the month sermon where I was just pretty fired up as we looked at Elijah, this great man of God. And, you know, I was up here sweating and spitting. So if you missed last week, you'll need to watch the video and uh, catch it, go online and, and, and watch the service. But today we want to kind of take a little bit more of a, I, I don't know how to describe it other than a little bit uh, of, of a broader perspective of prayer. And I'm not so sure that this is not going to be a two week thing. So hang in there with me as we dive in. We talk about freedom. We talk about what Christ brings in freedom. Again, we were seeing that in the video that was shared just a moment. We celebrate freedom in our nation, but what is the purpose of that freedom? Why are we free? Did God just bless, for example, our nation and say, I just think you're better than everybody else? Well, hopefully nobody thinks that. Hopefully we understand we, we live in a land that gives us an amazing opportunity to express our freedom in Christ that many, many places in the world do not have. But there's got to be a greater purpose than even that. What, what is it? Are we, what is it that we need to leverage for the greater glory of God? And I really believe that's key to why we've been blessed as much as we have in this land. The challenge always is taking those blessings and using them for our own personal benefit. Benefit. And so that's something that you and I have to fight. Even the gift of prayer. What is that really all about? Dive in with me here in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. You can just read it right up there on the screen as I read it. But so Jesus was saying to those Jews who have believed him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Now there's a, a sort of a clarifying statement. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And then verse 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You know, a lot of people claim the latter part of that verse, and they say, well, I know that the truth will make me free. Well, that's not all of what he said. It's knowing the truth. And once you know the truth, the truth will make you free. So what's the ultimate purpose of truth? Well, apparently here it is, at least in part, to set us free. We know that Paul writing to the church at Galatia said, listen, it is for freedom that you have been made free. And he went on to warn that church, once you've established, once you've experienced that freedom, don't go back into slavery. Don't back up into the bondage that you once were in prior to Christ. But press forward, maintain that, that standing and that, that persevering path toward this freedom that Christ not only gave you, but is increasingly building into your life every day. That's why our relationship with Christ is not a dead, cold religion that's stagnant, but it is a live, living, breathing, passionate relationship with Christ. You've heard me say an awful lot lately. We're, we're all excited about the God of the past. We love studying that history and getting that information. And we're really uh, excited about the God of eschatology that we know is going to cover the church and the future events. But where we are weak sometimes is understanding that he is also a now God. He's a God right now, as we prayed for this morning, that desires to manifest himself in your life in this place right now. And the challenge is, will you allow God to do something radical in your heart and your life this morning? John says there is a purpose. If you were to look at the greater context of the book of John, the gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 30, says, therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written, here's the purpose, so that you may believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, that by believing, you may have life in his name. 
So why, how do we tie all this to prayer? Well, it's truly through prayer that we build our relationship with Christ. It's through prayer that we build our relationship with God the Father. Without a constant, significant prayer life, we really don't grow, and what we end up with is religion, practices, religious practices that may be full of good things, but not necessarily where God desires for us to be. And one of the things that I've learned about God in my experience and, and life with, and even my understanding of Scripture, is that God is always pushing us. God never wants us to become stagnant in our relationship with Him. And that's why every day it's important to be in His presence. That's why every day it's important to pray. That's why every day it's important to be stretching and sharing the gospel with people that we might not know and, and that might not even be open to receiving that gospel. That's not our call. But we're pressing, we're moving forward with God. We, we've, got, you know, we've been doing these videos, and we've got about 10 or 12, I suppose, in the hopper that, again, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago. I can't wait to show all these to you. But I want to show you one very quickly about the difference in the truth and the lie. There's a little phrase in here that one of our students uses. And uh, listen, it's pretty profound. So watch this video very quickly. I hope we've got it here. My name is Nick Breen, and I'm going to be a junior this year. My struggle was with video games and how much fun they were. And I would believe the lie that I could have fun all my life and live in endless bliss. But in doing so, I would reject my family, friends, and everyone that I actually did care about. With God's help in through 10, I was able to actually rethink my life. Now, I'm trying to focus on God and I'm trying to see where he'll lead me. I, I don't know if it's just me, but is Nick not like something like he's 45 years old or something? I mean, he's like, he's so serious about all this, and I, I love that. But do you hear what he said? He thought he could just live life doing the things that I suppose, I mean, I don't mean to, it's a gross generalization, I know, but all teenagers do is just hang out and play video games, you know. I know that's not true, but you know that you just would think uh, that that seems kind of normal. Now, for every age group, we have those patterns. You know, you can't, you can't throw stones at the teenagers who love to just hang out and play video games because we as more mature adults, I didn't say older, more mature adults, I mean, we have those things that we get locked in patterns that really drive our lives. And yet life has got to be more than that. And Nick said, you know, I, I would believe the lie. You know, we don't need the lie. We need the truth. What is it that God wants us to be doing with this incredible stewardship of time that we have? Well, if you've been around here the last couple of months, you know that, first of all, it, it's got to always be about His glory. It's got to be about the kingdom of God. I don't just have time where I can sit in front of a screen. I, I, whether it's the, your phone or, or whether it's you know, a computer or an iPad or whether it's television or whatever it is. I, every moment of my life. And what if we were to begin to use that time in prayer? What if we were to take those opportunities and, and just turn all the electronic devices off and just say, God, speak to my heart. God, reveal your will for me at this moment and this day. And, and God, what you would give me direction for tomorrow. God, show yourself to me. What would happen to our lives? And again, that's part of the emphasis of 10. So if we want to find the truth, because the truth makes us free, then let's start here. The truth about prayer. That's really what I want to talk about this morning. The truth about prayer. Prayer. Now, that's not just a long introduction. All that was part of the teaching time this morning. But what is the truth about prayer? Well, let me give you three quick things that are not on the screens. And this is what I would call in my city of birth in New Orleans, we would call it lanyap. A little something extra. I won't charge you for this, but I promise you it's really, really good stuff. Here's what I know about prayer. Number one, it can be very frustrating. Prayer can be very frustrating, right? Oh, it is on the screen. I forgot. I gave them that. Frustrating, hard to focus, and admitting we have a need. Three things. Frustrating. What's the first one? What do I mean by that? You know, for me, sometimes prayer uh, is like uh, trying to take a run after a tornado came through the community. And I know that's a, that's a crazy description there, a, a crazy analogy. But if you've ever seen an area that's been hit by a tornado, you know, there's stuff everywhere, right? Hello? Thank you. I just want to make sure my mic was on. Chris may have turned me off this morning. I don't know. I mean, he's, uh, 
I'm picking, picking on the guy. I appreciate him. Hey, uh, but, but hear me. You know, think about it. There's just all these obstacles. There's all this stuff in the way. Not, not a good time to take a run when a tornado has just come through. Some of that could even be very, very, very damaging, uh, life-threatening maybe. And you know, when we begin to pray, does anybody else in the room experience that there seems to always be a lot of obstacles? Do you ever find that in prayer? Thank you. Good. Hey, I got more than two, Ethan. See, that's like seven or eight at least of that when they respond. We're moving, man. So, yeah. And you know, it's like you, you mean to and this happens and this happens and this happens and this happens. The second one there is simply this. It's hard to focus in prayer. How many of you try to pray when you drive? I, I'm really tempted to say, what are you praying when you're trying to drive? And then... Because I'm in Denver, I'm trying to say, Lord Jesus, help me not run over this lady. I'm telling you, I just, if that girl doesn't put the phone down and get out of the way, I'm pushing her off the road. I mean, I, I've got an old beat up pickup. What do I care, right? I mean, she's about to meet Mr. Median if she doesn't get out of the way. I'm telling you, this is ridiculous. So I, but you know, when you, I, when I try to pray, it seems like it's just hard to focus. Yeah, there's all these obstacles. There's all these things, number one, that keep me in the way. Very frustrating, it can be. Number two, it's hard to focus. I mean, I, I start thinking and I'm going, okay, God, was that you? Or was that me just going off on a, you know, squirrel? I mean, what, what was that? I mean, was that God or... So it's, it's hard to focus sometimes in prayer. And this is a reality, folks. This is a real truth right here. And then the third one is this, just admitting that we have a need. My wife says to me on a frequent basis, yeah, that's the problem. You don't think you have anything wrong with you. <laughs> yes, we do marriage conferences because we got lots of material to work with. But that, that's the reality. You know, admitting that we have a need, admitting that there's fault, admitting that we don't have it all together. And man, I'm telling you, in the world we live in, especially those of us that are privileged to live along the front range here in Denver, and we've got everything. Listen, you, you can go to all kinds of restaurants, any kind of food you want. You've got any kind of recreation you want. We've got lakes. I mean, we've got, not only do we have mountains, we've got bodies of water. You can go water ski. You do anything. I just, it's an amazing place. And, it, and it's real hard. It's real hard to really admit that we have a need. First of all, we get so wrapped up in all the good stuff of Colorado that we forget that there are deeper needs and there are more pressing issues of life than just feeling good and having fun. And we, we have a tendency to really wrestle with that. And men, that last one, that, that's probably where most men are. I mean, we, you know, we're, we're the guys, right? And I, I know that our culture has tried to uh, strip men of who they are in Christ and tried to water us down and, and, and uh, yeah, I better leave that alone. But I think you get the point. So, so here we go. The purpose of praying, and you gotta get this in your mind, the purpose of praying is not just to get answers. And I think a lot of us approach prayer primarily that way. Answers or provision or direction. But I want to say it. I've already said it once this morning. But let me say it again. It is about building a relationship with God. It's not just primarily communication so you make sure you're on the right path. It is building a relationship with God. So here's what I'm saying to you this morning. If you don't have a consistent, substantial prayer life, then your relationship with God stinks. I don't care what you try to mask it with. It, it's rotten. It's no good. It's, it's weak. I didn't say it didn't exist. But I'm telling you, it, it stinks because it has a little putridness to it because it's not healthy. The only way to do that and to have that strong relationship is to really develop. Understanding the realities that we just talked about, about the struggles to prayer. So a lot of us pray, and, and I, I put myself in this category, maybe this is you as well. Our prayer life is like kind of like, hey God, this is Jimmy, gimme, 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 amen. You know, and I, I apologize to the Jimmys in the room, all right? But that's kind of where it is. God, this is Jimmy. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give Amen. Now, let me, let me ask you. Has your prayer life ever been like that? How many of you be honest? Okay, so you wouldn't raise your hand because you said, I've never said Jimmy. <laughs> You're so spiritual. You said, no, that's not me. I never said Jimmy. Oh, come on. 
Let me try it again. How many of your prayer life's ever been like that? Yeah. I mean, I find myself, so, especially now with the 10 emphasis, and I've got the list of people. Alice Miller back there, we were up at camp this week, and she was showing me her prayer list, and she said, hey, about this prayer list thing. And she said, I had to throw away the booklet, and she pulls out her phone, and she's got like 39 names that she's going through every day praying for. You know, that's, that's right, that's a cool thing. I mean, it's awesome. But it's kind of like, really, God? I got to pray for another one? That's what we said we were talking about the other day. I think it was Thursday we were talking about that. And... Uh, the reality is, is that it's helping me, but, but it, it, it's, it's getting me to understand that it's not about my needs. It's not about my desires. It's not about my wants. It's not about my gimme, gimme, gimme. And, and sometimes with that list, I'm praying for these things, and I, I've got to back up and say, no, Lord, what do you want to say to my heart? God, what, what do you just want to pour into me at this moment through prayer? Hey, uh, Matthew chapter 6, and, and I apologize. I don't remember which scriptures I gave uh, Stephanie put on the screen or not. But if you were to look at Matthew chapter 6, which is in the Sermon on the Mount, beginning with verse 9, uh, we, we find, well, there it is. Thank you. Um, he, on the screen, if you don't want to turn. But look at this. Pray then like this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, we all know that. That's not the end of that prayer. But look where it starts. The focus of our prayer should be God. These are the words of Jesus we're reading in Matthew 6. The focus of our prayer should be God. Well, why, why can I say that? Because he said, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, holy be your name. The focus of your prayer life should be, should be, yeah. Now here's, here's the hard application. Remember, information without application won't ever lead to transformation. Is it? And if not, don't you think we ought to begin to adjust that? Don't you be, think we, begin, we need to begin to adjust that, listen, this, this is about God and the holiness of his name and ultimately his kingdom. Again, everything being done for his glory. He goes on through that prayer and, and he gives us several great things. We're not going to look at that today, but that seems to be the focus. Much of what we call prayer, I'm convinced, is not to God. You say, well, how can it not be to God, even if we're bringing him that divine that spiritual shopping list I think, I think sometimes it's just us expressing our wants and our desires but it's not really directed to God there's very little God thought in our praying sometimes and if it should be focused on God that ought to change that a couple of thoughts about that number one think about it when you pray publicly now, I, I, I know some of you could never pray publicly. I, I get that. I mean, you, you know, it'd be time for a diaper change if you did. I get it. It just scares you that much. I've had my grandchildren in town from Houston for the last two weeks, so diaper change is on my mind an awful lot, right? Um, publicly, when you pray publicly, big challenge there. We know the Scripture warns us about that, not to be seen, not to be heard, all that kind of stuff. But really, when we pray publicly, I occasionally find myself doing one of two things. I find myself trying to impress people with what I say. Now, folks, look, this is taking the covers off. This is revealing the pastor's heart. I catch myself sometimes when I'm praying publicly, trying to impress people. I don't know that I would say with knowledge or whatever, but just trying to impress people with... Hey, are you listening? I mean, I'm obviously, me and God are like this, you know. Can you tell by my praying, you know? And listen to the things that I say. Aren't you impressed by that? I mean, do you walk away? Did you hear pastor's prayer? Oh, he's such a godly man. Oh, he loves Jesus. So, Can I tell you, Satan whispers that garbage in my ear sometimes when I'm praying publicly. And I'm just telling you, if you're not tempted by that when you pray when you're praying publicly, well, I don't believe you. That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> but then sometimes it's like people use prayer to impart things, to impart. So impress and impart, right? 
You know what I mean by impart something? Like then it is, let, let, me, let me manipulate this flow of thought here with, with what I'm saying. Let me pray you to where I want you to be. And man, I do that one all the time. I mean, I probably did it this morning when I closed out our, our corporate prayer time. So there's a battle there publicly when we pray, right? There's a war going on. You still listening? Yes. Do you have those struggles? Yes. And then personally, so publicly, there's those battles plus many other. Personally, I mean, we're back to Jimmy, gimme, gimme. Personally, when I pray, often all I'm doing is thinking of my needs and saying, God, meet my need, meet my need, meet my need, meet my need. And that's not really growing me in the relationship with Christ that I need. And then then there's a third thing I'd point out about that. Actually, there's two more. Uh, There there seems to be, again, seldom a a clear, deep sense that, listen to this, that I'm actually now in the presence of God. I, I understand theologically we're always in the presence of God, right? We're never apart from God. I get that. Don't, don't send me an email and say, well, pastor, you know, we are, you know, you should know that we're... I get that. I know the Holy Spirit dwells in us. I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. I get all that. But I think there ought to be a cognitive switch that flips when I begin to pray that I, I need to say, you know what? I'm really... I, I mean, I'm... Look, I'm focusing now. I am in the presence of of the one true God and I promise you if you'll begin to intentionally do that it will change your approach to prayer and then I would say the the fourth thing quickly here is that I I would encourage you to begin with silence in prayer and I mean I don't know if you talk out loud when you pray by yourself I, I do sometimes sometimes I don't but I just mean even mental silence when Sherry and I pray together quite often we, we kind of know this. We'll say, hey, you want to pray? I'll ask her, you, you want to pray about something or something going on? I'll say, hey, you, you want to pray with me? And she'll say, sure. And I'll say, okay. And so we just get quiet. And it's not like we're sitting there going, would you go first? That's not what we're doing. We, we both have kind of developed this sense of we know that we need to kind of get our minds and our hearts focused on the presence of God. Now look, you can pray anytime, you, you can pray, boom, you can flip the switch like that and pray. I get that, I understand that. But what we're talking about is the truth that will set you free in prayer, that will take you deeper in prayer. And when you begin to reflect and think about the presence of God and the person of God, and you don't just fly through some list, you don't just mark off the missionaries and the pastors and the teachers and the people that are sick, and you, but you're really just pausing and, and saying, God, now we, and by the way, folks, that is exactly what praying in the Spirit is all about. It's letting the Holy Spirit prompt your prayer rather than giving the Jimmy Gimme list to God. It's literally saying, God, you direct this conversation. Holy Spirit, you guide these words. And it's so important that we, we learn to do that. Are we praying like that? I, I hope you will think about it. So here, here we go. Prayer is God's plan for knowing and growing in Him. Ephesians chapter 3. I know this one's not on the screen. Ephesians chapter 3. So you want to quickly turn over there in your Bible. We're going to, I'll read the verses, but I I hope you would look along. Ephesians chapter 3, knowing and growing. As you're turning, obviously Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus. He's trying to encourage them to deepen themselves in their faith. And he actually is praying in these verses we're going to read. So this is Paul's example of prayer. Now look, we looked two weeks ago at Jesus praying. We looked last week at Elijah praying. Now we're looking at Paul praying. You're there, Ephesians 3. May I ask you, do you think Jesus, Elijah, and Paul, pretty significant people in the kingdom of God? Is that fair? Jesus, Elijah, Paul, pretty significant people in the kingdom of God. All right, keep that in mind. Ephesians 3, verse 14. Here he goes. This is how he prays. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Oh, my word, there it is again. I do what? I bow my knees before the Father. Uh, 
I've said it for three weeks now. We'll say it more. Do you think there is something significant about the posture of prayer? Yes. I, I, I just, I'm just going to leave it hanging right there. Okay? There it is again. Jesus bowed. Elijah bowed. Paul bowed. Listen, I'm going to say it. <laughs> I get that some knees can get down, but they can't get back up. But if that's not your case, and you were hesitant to bow in prayer, at least on occasion, I'd really check the source of my resistance. I would really check the source of my resistance. Verse 15, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know, key word, circle it if you'd like, to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Verse 20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us to him be the glory in the church and Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So what does that do? That kind of praying we're talking about now, it protects us from becoming religious. Significant point. It protects us from becoming religious. If we understand that prayer, the truth about prayer, the freedom that prayer brings is to keep us from being religious. It literally grows us in a relationship. It's about knowing and growing in Christ. Without a significant prayer time, we're not knowing, we're not growing in Christ. And we have a tendency to become religious. Let me say it one more time. Thank the Lord for your prayer list. Thank the Lord that many of you are engaging in 10 and praying for 10 people every day for 10 months. Thank you that you're doing that. But folks, it cannot end there. That's the baby steps to prayer. That's why we've encouraged our entire fight, faith family to engage and join us in this daily. If you can't take the baby steps, how will you ever walk and run for the glory of God? Start! You say, well, man, it's July, and I, you know, we've only got a few more months of this 10 thing. Start now. It's okay. Don't, don't let the devil lie to you anymore. Come on. Let, let's do this together. The path of prayer leads to knowing Christ. By the way, there in verse 19, the word know that he uses there, it is the same word that's used when Paul and Christ both talk about sexual intimacy between a husband and a wife. Same word. There's a deep level here. In a marriage, without that kind of physical intimacy, there is a struggle. It's God's way of encouraging that relationship within the confines of a husband and a wife who are married under the covenant of God. And the same is true in our relationship with God the Father. There is this deep level of connection that cannot be explained or experienced any other way. And it comes through prayer and our relationship with Him. I, I frankly think that we have weakened Bible study and prayer to such an extent that, and, and I've said this a bunch lately. In fact, I said it just a few moments ago, I think. Bible study has become information without transformation that leads to application. You see it? Bible study has become information without transformation that leads to application. And God's ultimate goal is that it would lead to application because we've been changed by the power of the Word. I prayed for that earlier this morning. And then prayer, look at this, has become a shopping list to have our desires met. I mean, it's been watered down. It's been brought down to that level because we don't understand this intimate thing that God is doing in our prayer relationship with Him. 
All right, let me switch gears. We can ask anything. I like that. The scripture teaches that in prayer, we can ask anything. And of course, implied of God. We can ask anything. Now certainly power comes when we pray according to the word, according to the will of God. And we are most in the zone when we're praying in line with what the word of God says. But hear me, you can ask God anything. Look at Psalm 145, verse 18. Psalm 145, 18. I put so much of this on the screen today because we had so many verses. If you're a guest today, normally I'm in one passage and we're kind of going verse by verse, word by word. But again, we're looking at this sort of more distant view of prayer. Look at this. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. We're back to that word truth. That's New American Standard. Some translations have integrity. Look at it one more time. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth or integrity. So what is that word now, truth or integrity? What, what does that mean? What is he saying? He's saying that he's near to me if I call upon him, if I call upon him in truth. Question? So is truth significant to our prayer life? Yes. Well, sure. Because the promise here is that he's near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in, in truth. You say, well, that's Old Testament. We're under grace. We don't have to worry about all that. Oh, yeah. First John. Okay. First John chapter 3. Look on the screen. Beginning with 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. <laughs> Verse 22, and whatever we ask, we receive from him. Why? Because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Is that the New Testament? 1 John chapter 3? I, th I thought that was, Don, I know you've retired, but is that still in the New Testament? You're right? Okay, all right, it's still there, huh? Okay, so we're not, this is not, don't scream law, don't scream legalism. That's, that, I'm telling you, if you hear that, that is the enemy, that is Satan himself. We've got New Testament stuff here, folks. And it's reminding us that, listen, God still cares about obedience. God still cares about our faithfulness. And he says, listen, whatever we ask, we receive from him. Why? Because we keep, that's what it means to call upon him in truth and integrity. Do you ever run across someone who said, well, you know what? I, I, I used to believe in God. I used to pray. I used to do all those things, but I just, I gave up. And you say to him, well, well what happened? Why did you quit? Well, God, God didn't answer my prayers. God didn't do what I wanted him to do. Now, you know what? They've already walked away from God, so why not be bold and look at them and say, well, let me ask you something. When you were praying that, were you keeping God's word? And were you, you literally doing what was pleasing in his sight with your life? Now, back up in case they swing at you, right? But ask them. Because the New Testament says, and it's not just this passage, there are multiple passages that say the same thing. It's like we talk about, well, you're a friend of God. Well, you're a friend of God if you keep his commandments. That's what the Bible says. Not just because you wave a flag and say, I'm a friend of God, let's dance, you know. I know that was kind of goofy, but that's best I can do prior to surgery anyway. So here we go. Look, look at this. Two things. Keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Now look, let, let's drive this home. All right? One reason... We do not take seriously the gift of prayer. Is that deep within we know things will change. I'll let that soak in. Well, why is it that a lot of people never get around to praying on a regular basis? God, we need an awakening in the church 
God, we need a great move of your spirit in our church. For you old schoolers like me, God, we need a revival. God, bring a revival. Why are we not daily on our face before God crying out for those things? Can I just say to you that this week God took me to these scriptures and stripped me and said, Tony, this is why you're not pounding the gates of heaven for this. Why, Lord? Because if a great move of God comes, your life will be totally changed. The activities and the events and the allure of the world will no longer be what drives you. Your schedule will change. Your focus will change. Your passions will change. We don't cry out for a great move of God because we know if God moves, my life will have to be different. I won't be able to live for me. We know that the church will be a priority. Why? Because the church is a priority to Jesus. We know that the church and the activities of the church will no longer have to fit in to our secular schedules. Why? Because if God really moved in our lives, Jesus would be the most important thing. And most of the lukewarm church today does not want that. And guess what, folks? We're probably not going to see it. You can call upon him, and you can ask whatever you want to if you ask with integrity and truth. Why would God bring a revival when he knows most of us don't genuinely want it? You might have to show up on Wednesday night. We've gotten used to not coming on Wednesday night. We like it. We don't have Sunday night worship any longer. Well, you know, we got to, oh, it's so hard to drive downtown. Let somebody give you free baseball tickets. I bet you get here. Let somebody give you Bronco tickets. I bet you show up on Sunday afternoon. Look. When I get done here on Sunday, I go into a coma. I'm not advocating that we revive a Sunday evening worship service. But I'm giving you some real, real world truthful applications of why most of us are not crying out to God. We don't really want people to be saved and see this church flooded with new believers in Christ because then we'd have to disciple them. Some of you that could teach would have to actually start teaching some of you that have all kinds of gifts to serve, you'd, you'd have to actually start implementing that stuff. You don't like me right now, do you? I, I can kind of feel it in the room. It's like, we don't like you right this moment. But you've got to love me. There's a battle for transformation. Can I tell you what I've just described to you is spiritual warfare. Satan has the modern church lukewarm and all but dead. There's no real passion and power in most of our daily lives because we're not being set free by this truth of prayer. Now some of you are in prayer groups and man, you're, you're beating the doors of heaven. Praise God for that but are you really understanding what you're asking for? And God knows in your heart of hearts whether that prayer is really of truth and integrity. And I want to give you this last thought because I want to give you something encouraging. I don't think that was real encouraging probably for a lot of people in the room. So let me give you this. Anyone can pray if their desire is to meet with God. Anyone can pray if their desire is to meet with God. You know what? I used to teach that differently. I used to say, no, not anyone can pray. 
I used to say that only those who have a relationship with Jesus Christ can pray because you can't talk to God any other way through Jesus, than through Jesus Christ. You have no access to God, the creator and the sustainer of all existence other than Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Either that's true or Jesus is a liar and we need to get rid of that psycho. I choose to believe it's true. There's no other access to God but Jesus Christ. He's the only one who paid for your sin. He's the only one who broke down the barriers. He's the only one. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. We sang about it all morning long, right? Anyone can pray if they desire, if their desire is to meet with God, but it requires faith. I do believe that anybody that turns in faith to God, no matter where they are spiritually, if they turn to God in faith, trusting, believing in Him, I believe God will supernaturally work by the power of the Holy Spirit and draw that person in the right relationship. So there is that caveat. There is that little tag. Anybody can pray. Listen to me, that means anybody in the room. I anybody in the room. Now, for those of you that think that's not you, help me out, church. Look at your neighbor and say, you can pray. Go ahead, please. Don't miss anybody. Come on, Bill. Turn to Debbie. Tell her she can pray. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody covered? Did everybody, did everybody participate? Because somebody beside you needs to know they can pray. They need to hear you say it because they don't trust preachers. And for good reason. Okay? That means you. You, you, you can pray. Just a little bit, just, just a little sample of the truth about prayer. Hey, when you're rolling those hot dogs over the grill, flipping those burgers, whatever it is you're going to do over the next couple of days, remember what real freedom is. Remember the incredible gift you've been given. And, and let's, let's begin to seriously pray. And see a great move of God. Are you up for it? Yes. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you. And God, we're so grateful for everything that you've done to provide life for us. God, we acknowledge this morning that without you, we can truly do nothing. And yet, God, with you, Lord, everything is possible. God, help us not to mess that formula up, God. There's, there's no other way to do this other than in right relationship with you. And God, that, that certainly is developed through prayer. And God, I, I just say before my family, God, right now in faith, Lord, forgive me for being an obstacle to a great move of God. I like my life, God. For the most part, I like my schedule. I, I like being able to do what I want to do so much of every day. And God, I like being able to decide my priorities based on my family and just, just what I want. God, forgive me for not understanding my call from you to die to me. And God, as I do that, then leading my family to do that. Oh God, deepen my prayer relationship that I might know and grow in Christ. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen.